In this video, we're looking at John Finnis. Uh, this is section D of the EDUCAS RS um, ethics syllabus and its development of natural law. This is a modern approach. Uh, John Finnis, born 1940. Um, he's an Australian and he's a legal philosopher. Uh, law and ethics aren't the same thing. Um, there's a, a link between them. Um, but he's working from a legal perspective. Um, he works at the University of Notre Dame. I mean, he's 80 now, so I'm not quite sure how much he's still working, but anyway, he is. Uh, Notre Dame uh, University, that's a Roman Catholic uh, university in Indiana. Syllabus then for Finnis is this. Looking then at Finnis, theoretical and practical reason. This is it's very nuanced uh, development of natural law, uh, which requires um, some very nuanced understanding of the words uh, that uh, Finnis is using and how he is using them. One of the great advantages of working with contemporary scholars is you can actually uh, go directly to them, not just in their books, uh, but you find them on YouTube. So there's a couple of uh, uh, videos here. I'll put these in the uh, notes below. This is a key work um, of Finnis. This is the one that um, I'm basing this on. Um, this is the uh, uh, Natural Law and Natural Rights. This is the 1980 edition uh, that I have. As a quote from it there. Okay, let's get into the details then of John Finnis talking about natural law. Now Finnis is trying to work with natural law uh, outside, uh, formally outside, a religious framework. Um, Finnis personally is a Roman Catholic and so he can't uh, step outside his own worldview, nor can anybody else. There's no such thing as neutrality. So what he's trying to do is work outside an explicitly religious framework, which of course makes it accessible to everyone. So natural law then is about the law of reason. Um, so it's not about nature as we would today understand that term. So it's about um, our, our thinking. So as we look back to the, um, the historical origins of this uh, line of thinking, uh, Finnis is going to focus primarily on Aristotle, uh, which is about reason uh, rather than Aquinas, uh, which is about revelation. What Finnis is trying to do here is get down to some absolutely first principles of rational thought as reasoning about what we should be doing, how we should live. Now, Finnis' approach means that it theoretically should be applicable universally. He's just looking at shared human values that should, uh, if he's correct, uh, transcend uh, cultures, um, history, um, geography. And Finnis modifies Aquinas. So Aquinas then, humans can reason that the purpose of life is to re-establish a right relationship with God. Now, Finnis argues that, in fact, natural law's purpose um, is broader than that um, because he says that natural law's purpose is to ensure a person is able to live a worthwhile life to flourish, i.e. to establish what is good for humankind, so the totality of humanity. And that is natural law's purpose, so it should therefore uh, be universal. So looking at a contrast then between Aquinas and Aristotle, Aquinas you could see as a, a from above approach, uh, an idea in it was a theological approach. So Aquinas was uh, very much concerned with what's revealed from God, uh, but also alongside that um, revealed from God, an awareness of the from below approach of Aristotle. Now Aristotle was a philosophical approach in contrast to Aquinas theological and Aristotle um, is sort of from below it was that which is uh, clearly accessible to everyone 
uh, is thinking about what can be observed and experienced. And Aristotle, um, what from experience delivers eudaimonia uh, and was common human values. Uh, so Finnis here is um, really leaning more in the direction of Aristotle than Aquinas. He's, he's um, parting company with Aquinas in his work here to ensure that it has a universal appeal. Now, one of the, um, the things here you'll find that as you look at Finnis, uh, there's a huge amount of Finnis, uh, which looks very much uh, as if it is simply a refinement of a virtue ethics approach. There's a very clear overlap between a virtue ethics approach. Don't think of virtue ethics purely as, as Aristotle. Uh, there's a, a very powerful, very important strand of modern virtue ethics thinking and Finnis uh, overlaps significantly with that. I mean, you could in fact look at Finnis as the sort of formal legal uh, element of uh, a virtue ethics approach to um, to life. OK, Finnis starts by rejecting Aquinas' five primary precepts because he rejects Aquinas' axioms, the axioms being that natural law is based on God and that God created humanity's purpose. So what Finnis is doing here is, I don't I actually know how sort of committed and orthodox a, a Roman Catholic Finnis is, uh, but what he's certainly doing here is he's trying to make sure that his work um, is comprehensible and um, acceptable to those who are working outside, not only working outside the Roman Catholic framework, but working outside a, a theistic, he used the broad term, religious framework. And what Finnis does then, he replaces Aquinas' primary precepts with what he calls basic goods. Now for Finnis then, these basic goods are self-evident, there's seven of them, and they are universal. Now the self-evident nature of these basic goods is very important to Finnis. Uh, Finnis makes a distinction between theoretical reasoning and practical reasoning. A theoretical reason, a reasoning is exactly what it says really. This is about the, um, the reasoning truth, it's about thinking, um, it's about the theoretical stuff, it's the sort of sitting in the armchair type of, of working and it's far more focused on that than it is on the right action. A practical reasoning, uh, this is, um, Finnish uses Aquinas medieval understanding of practical reasoning. So this practical reasoning, this is about how we live. This is focused on the, uh, the actions. It's uh, about real life. And so Finnis reformulates the basic goods of Aquinas to make them appropriate to modern life. Uh, what he's got then, these basic goods are ones which are so obvious they're not really thought about. They are uh, operating at a sort of um, careful with the wording here, but I use the word subconscious level. Uh, they are just the bedrock of our, of our lives. And there's numerous basic goods that uh, Finnis proposes. And so what we need to do is we need to sort these out before we can act. They, uh, they might end up um, maybe not in conflict, but you've got to order them in priority to work out which one's going to apply. And that is going to require uh, another layer of understanding. And a lot of this uh, requires a uh, culture. Uh, the culture provides the moral understanding of what is uh, right and wrong um, in terms of pursuing these basic goods. OK, this is Peter Vardy on Finnis. You notice Finnis, this is it's rooted very much in in the practical, in the uh, what we have uh, observed through living. So Vardy says, Finnis argues that unless law is grounded in what it is to be human and relates to a moral code, then human beings will not see that following the law is morally right and will obey it only out of habit or fear, whilst the tools of civic education and enforcement endure. They will not feel that the law has the moral authority to coerce people, to use prison and even death as punishment. Finnis claims that a law can be legally valid, even if unjust, 
but there can be no moral justification for enforcing an unjust law. So this brings us back to the fact that Finnis is working in the area of law, which isn't quite the same thing as morality. And you notice here uh, that uh, Finnis is, again, keep coming back to this, that what he's uh, aiming to do is just look at a sort of biological, zoological level and say, here is the species Homo sapien. Um, how do these, how does this species relate to each other? Homo sapiens are social creatures. OK, so you get all these Homo sapiens living together. Um, how are they going to work out that uh, that community so they can actually uh, live together, function together, support each other and so maximise their uh, abilities as the species Homo sapien. OK, here is Finnis, seven basic human goods. Now, very importantly, um, these are the standalone that none of these Finnis is saying that each of these um, just is itself. Uh, they're of equal importance. You can't then start reducing um, one of the others. To, to, you can't reduce them to each other. The, these are the seven he's saying are distinct. OK, so it starts with life, um, covers various aspects of life from bodily health to procreation. At 2011, he put an update in here. Finnis added marriage um, between a man and a woman to this basic good. B, knowledge. This is for its own sake, means being well informed. See, play again for its own sake. You don't need to play for any other reason. You're playing for the reason of playing, recreation, enjoyment and fun. Aesthetic experience and appreciation of beauty and art. And this is nothing to do with any of the others. This just stands on its own. A sociability, friendship. At the basic level, it's being sociable. Ultimately, it's acting in the interests of one's friends. A practical reasonableness. That's using one's intelligence to solve moral problems such as how to live and what to do. And the final one then is religion. So Finnis has got this as a connection with um, participation with uh, very general terms, orders that transcend individual humanity. So this is a, about ultimate questions, but it's not necessarily being involved with a religious institution. And he certainly wants to detach it from being um, well, very specifically, he wants to detach this from saying being um, a, a member of the Roman Catholic Church. So he wants this in its uh, broadest sense. OK, let's look at an example then. Knowledge as a basic good. OK, so we start then children ask questions. Boy, do they ask questions when they discover the word why. OK, they get answers and these answers lead to further questions. Now, then this is the, the important bit. This this picks up a few things in Finnis. At some point, it just clicks. And that's a very important idea that we just understand uh, that there is knowledge, a whole indefinite field of understanding of questions being answered. Further acts of understandings. Now, these are um, distinct. You then just have this idea that knowledge is good. Um, knowledge is an opportunity for benefit. Ignorance and mistakes, they're, they're bad news, really. If you're ignorant and you, you're going to make mistakes and mistakes um, tend to be painful. OK, confusion is bad. But let's go back to the just clicks bit. This comes back to a lot of what Finnis is doing, where our understanding, we, we do skirt around um, epistemology, quite a lot of this as we talk about knowledge, um, and there's no epistemology within our syllabus, so it's a bit of a problem, really. Uh, but just be careful when you're looking at, at what we mean by the word no, okay? And what Finnish is talking about here is the is knowing at a sort of a deep embodied level. Uh, the participative level. We know it because we we just participate in life. It's not something we know as we've learned it as a fact or we have, you know, clearly observed it empirically in an experiment. And a lot of this knowledge that Finnis is talking about is just so deeply embedded within us uh, that we aren't even aware of it as knowledge that we have. 
Um, it's it's obviously not quite the same as we know how to breathe because that's really it's a very um, that's so deeply embedded within us that we have no control over it. Um, but we you need to to look at it moving in that direction uh, as Finnis is talking about how we know these basic goods. So when these basic goods, so we'll just, so knowledge then. Um, you know, knowledge is not it's not morally good or morally bad and it's, it's humanly good. So a lot of what Finnis is doing here is saying just what does it mean to be a member of the species Homo sapien? And this is humanly good. Uh, and this is so this is what we're trying to get at when what Finnis is talking about with these basic goods. So understanding is this very deeply embedded um, embodied knowledge and, and there's a tendency for empiricist philosophers they um, a lot of the time use the word see and it's, a, it's a metaphor um, sight uh, you know that idea of experimental uh, you can prove it um, and this deeper level of understanding is 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 different so yeah just bear in mind uh, that there's no epistemology in this course uh, and that is um well it's not just a huge area uh, in philosophy epistemology is a pretty basic um layer of of, of of philosophy so just be aware that you you're going into an area here um where your knowledge is a bit thin so this is about different types of knowledge okay so finnis then is saying that these are human goods and so therefore the seven basic goods apply equally to everyone at all times but they don't people aren't automatically aware of these basic goods so it's a very obvious level the toddler may not understand the need for practical reasonableness but and what finnis puts in here they're known to every educated and mature person there's a very clear link here with aristotle we need to be careful um, of thinking that um, you know morality is is simple you know you, you, your smart 13 year old can learn how to um, to work with utilitarianism and and can't um, you know I know because I, I used to teach that at, um, at year nine level and so you know I had no problem the, the bright ones they could learn it they could put it into practice they could do the, the sort of calculation type level but the the whole of the virtue ethics tradition uh, the virtue ethics uh, revival and the modern uh, drive for virtue ethics says actually you know you can't the smart 13 year old you might be able to sort of do the sums and come up with basic utilitarian answers or you know apply Kant's categorical imperatives but that is nothing at all to do with real human life let's take a quote here from Finnis Near the very beginning of the tradition of theorising about natural right, we find Aristotle quite explicit that ethics can only be usefully discussed with experienced and mature people and that age is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for the required maturity. OK, so these basic goods then, they work, they're an explanation of why we do things. And so activities, they're worthwhile or not worthwhile uh, to the degree they participate in one or more of the basic goods. And very importantly, these basic goods, they're not fulfilled. Uh, they are participated in. And so this this is about just living as a member of the species Homo sapiens. So you know, the, the, um, I played a fun game of hide and seek with my children. Now, you've not achieved here the basic good of play what you've done you've participated in it uh, other positive qualities there's other things as well freedom and humility um, Finnis uses an example and he says what these are merely their methods by which we can pursue one or more of the basic goods so there are clearly uh, motivations for action a pursuit of pleasure material gain and Finnis says these are misguided uh, these are motivated by human inclination rather than practical reason okay there's this focus here he's got on practical reason the only way for humans to flourish 
um, that idea of human flourishing again. You know, you, you hear the echoes there of, uh, of Aristotle with his eudaimonia uh, and live worthwhile lives. Uh, it's to follow the self-evident universal basic goods. Now, Finnis uh, believes that people who don't respect these basic goods are wrong. They are bad people.